último paso, sin ceder un milímetro, estamos aplicando la estrategia integral contra el terrorismo. Ahora que ya no tenemos frente a nosotros la oposición obstruccionista que bloqueaba la acción del gobierno, ahora vamos a aplicar esta estrategia en su integridad. is a very useful instrument for physicians who has to assess the cases of torture because they give us guidelines how to do this in a standard way that could be really generalized in almost to every country in the world. Desde las 2 de la madrugada del miércoles 6 de mayo, policías y soldados de la división blindada del ejército comenzaron a machacar el pabellón 1A de Canto Grande, ocupado por más de 100 mujeres. Fujimori, autor de su propio golpe de estado solo un mes antes, ordenó trasladar a las presas fuera del penal y éstas se resistieron. The uh, military intervention lasted for two days and used um, weapons that you usually uh, see in conventional armed uh, warfare. Ellas no estaban opuestas al traslado y queremos pues evitar el genocidio, porque como dijo ya la familiar, esto va a devenir a un genocidio tipo 86. The events were portrayed to the national media and to the society in Peru as acts that were um, use of force that was just necessary to prevent uh, violence escalating in a prison. And uh, the authorities claim that this was, was in fact a riot, and that they were using force to then, um, to, that was just necessary for the state to, to control the, the order in, in prisons. Uh, in fact, this was a, a cover up, and uh, for Peruvians, uh, this cover up story was the truth. Uh, in the context of this um, intervention, where thousands of armed uh, officers were used, uh, there were um, many people injured, about 200 prisoners injured, and there were about 50 prisoners that resulted dead. El final del asalto fue espectacular. Durante cinco horas, el pabellón 4B fue bombardeado incluso con bazocas. Los senderistas, exhaustos, se defendían con bombas, pistolas y algunas armas largas, además de dardos envenenados. Los gritos se oían desde el lugar más de 500 metros al que fueron retirados prensa y familiares. Aquí ya se encuentra 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 14, 15 heridos. Pues 15 heridos se encuentran en, en, en las inmediaciones del patio pues, para, para ser esto evacuado por su mismo personal de mujeres. Pero las mujeres todavía no deciden salir. En el exterior, noche del sábado, las familias esperaban ver sacar heridos y muertos. Por la intensidad de la batalla, todos creían que los muertos serían muchos. Los bomberos daban la cifra de 60 presos desaparecidos. Um, and now there were extrajudicial executions in that context. And after the events, uh, there was a new system for prisons. So the survivors were subjected to different forms of torture. These uh, forms of torture uh, remain uh, hidden from the outside society. The International Red Cross didn't have access to, to the prisons for some time, and so prisoners were totally vulnerable in the hands of the state um, for a, a period that lasted over um, five months of total incommunicado situation. Uh, 
many of the prisoners uh, were subjected to the following, you know, the main practices that were occurring there, women and men. Um, total isolation from the world, um, wearing the same clothes that were full of blood, um, how they, they survived the massacre. Um, uh, electroshocks with electricity uh, by uh, the aid of uh, batons that were used in prisons. Uh, the batons would be used uh, uh, in different manners. Um, falanga beatings, which was a, a systematic practice in, in prisons in Peru at the time. Um, uh, forced nudity, um, use of dogs uh, on prisoners that were uh, lying on the ground for over, over a week, almost 15 days, living outside uh, on a yard and having no access to uh, medical attention or um, uh, even uh, facilities to wash th themselves. They couldn't move. They were subjected to forced positions. <laughs> Desde ese sábado hace siete días, los 359 hombres que se rindieron permanecen al aire libre tumbados boca abajo en el patio central del pabellón 4B. Durante esta semana los disparos han seguido escuchándose en los alrededores y a la morgue de Lima continúan llegando cadáveres que según las autopsias pertenecen a presos que habían fallecido varios días después de que la batalla del penal hubiera concluido. Entre los muertos se hallan cinco de los seis máximos dirigentes de Sendero que estaban en el penal. La prensa habla de asesinatos selectivos. protocol was a very powerful tool for my work, I must say. This was seen by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, where I first filed a case uh, to, uh, as a case concerning use of force, basically, and as a case concerning extrajudicial executions. From the perspective of uh, the lawyer, uh, that is me as a representative, um, um, I regard this case uh, also as a very important case concerning the prohibition of torture. Uh, the uh, uh, commission uh, uh, argued that uh, the treatment that the prisoners were afforded days after the, the massacre amounted to degrading uh, and cruel treatment. So that's mistreatment. Uh, and uh, my uh, case had to be to prove before the court that uh, what actually happened constituted torture. Witnesses, the Istanbul Protocol is a very important document. It introduces a common standard. Why is a common standard important? Um, there are two reasons. One thing is that science and medical knowledge, psychological knowledge, are developing. Um, the understanding of the deep impact of traumatic life events is something that is not sufficiently taught in medical schools. So it's very important to have a standard you can refer to that draws attention to the fact how deep going the impact of trauma is. This is one important role of the Istanbul Protocol. The 
second very important point for expert witnesses is that even if you're an expert witness and you obviously should you you should be independent still in many countries you are in a lot of pressure we might have to distinguish uh, international courts where there's a lot of let's say political pressure because uh, all findings are not only scientific uh, so they should be but they will also be interpreted in a political way it's also important in countries where there is a lot of local political pressure uh, where you even have the role of let's say dual obligation experts if you think about for example uh, experts that work for the police or for the government and you have a case of for example torture where the suspected perpetrator is an official of the government like a policeman or like a soldier uh, then the pressure on expert witnesses becomes quite strong again the big help of the Istanbul protocol is that you refer to an accepted standard you're not able to if you want you're not able to just circumvent the necessary findings you have to reach a conclusion and you cannot um, play it down so the Istanbul protocol can be a big help in that situations because you can refer to it uh, even against the pressure of the local authorities it still takes a lot of courage of course and uh, uh, professional ethical dedication but it is an option One of the things I realized uh, during the litigation uh, was that obviously you want to prevent torture. You want to prevent these acts. And one of the uh, uh, possibilities in litigation is the um, uh, measure of guarantees of non-repetition. So um, I focused then, I started thinking about how to prevent these acts in countries, say, where torture is systematic or we, we don't want torture to occur. Uh, in order to do that, I think the, to implement the Istanbul Protocol is important. Uh, and in order to implement the Istanbul Protocol, this has to be a, a thought from the perspective of uh, uh, the medical professionals, but also from the perspective of um, a legal mind that understands how a system works, because uh, both disciplines are necessary. Um, I have benefited greatly of uh, the uh, contribution of forensic uh, doctors on, in, in different cases that I have done. And I would think that uh, the protocol is uh, a, a given a, a, a framework and, and uh, given the proper understanding of how to um, assess someone and how to assess facts and uh, determine whether actually torture occurred or not. The Istanbul Protocol advised that the physician has to follow a procedure in the process of the, of the evaluation of a torture victim. for the trauma history. You have to go later to asking about the different methods of torture that you have been really applying to the victim. And later you have to go to do a physical examination, a complete physical examination. And you have, you have to do, in addition, a forensic evaluation of the lesion that the person has. That is going to include 
to do drawing of those, you have to do some photograph of this evidence. Uh, you have to also consider other medical problems that the person could have. And finally, you have to put all this together in a written is, uh, affidavit or report, and you have to have some conclusion in relation to the legion that you have really observed. And basically, the thing that you have to do is or to say in the affidavit that the legion that you have found are or not consistent with the type of trauma, physical trauma, that the person has. And you can say in relation to your experience, is the grade of consistency that this type of legion have, because most of the time we don't have a real legion so typical of torture, and then basically most of the legions you find are to be more or less consistent with the type of trauma. internationally accepted standards to describe what happens to a victim of persecution, uh, to describe it in clear terms that are beyond discussion. And uh, I think this made a very good impact in the legal procedure, because it was not about subjective interpretation, which can be a problem, especially in mental health sequels, but it was quite an objective standard that is beyond dispute. And so I think without the Istanbul Protocol, it would have been much more difficult to make um, non-psychotherapists, let's say lawyers, officials of the court, understand what the impact of trauma is. The Istanbul Protocol uh, uh, makes the point that to witness um, violence inflicted on another person, particularly if it's a close relative, um, causes suffering that is so serious uh, psychologically that can cause trauma, can cause PSTD, that constitutes torture. Uh, that, is, that was already there in the Istanbul Protocol. And yet uh, we haven't had uh, jurisprudence in the system uh, 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 yet on that. So when I talk to the, to the relatives, I realized that in fact the trauma was very, very severe. When the psychologist uh, um, spoke to them, even after 13 years, all this trauma was there. Assessing the elements of torture, we could, we could see that, in effect, we could argue that they had been psychologically tortured because they watched everything that happened from outside the prison. This watching was intentional because the, the, the state authorities wanted to make a, a point to society and, in particular, to the relatives, to the people close to these enemies of the state, that that's a punishment for people who, 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 who did... Uh, acts that the state considered um, uh, went against uh, uh, the security of the state. So uh, uh, the mothers uh, were traumatized by watching with their own eyes how their children were bombarded and, and up to today they have nightmares. They were subjected to, to, you know, also to repression outside, uh, and all of that was caused by acts of the state. So state agents were causing this suffering, and that was a, a, a possible to make this argument together with a medical uh, report based on, on the interviews. And I think that the court was very uh, uh, open 
to regard this, uh, to listen to this uh, uh, position, and I, the, the point of departure was uh, the Istanbul Protocol. Mm -hmm.